Okay, so let's check out this new paragraph. I worked on the transition sentence for the next paragraph. And I was going to say later in part two, um, but uh, condemnation mode, but it's, it's a little bit um, sort of uh, pedestrian language, like um, colloquial, like condemnation mode is a little bit um, you know, you want to be formal. It's a little bit informal. So, and then also, this is just strictly chronological. I know I did that a little bit with the earlier essay, and some teachers might have marked that off. Um, you know, they want every single paragraph to have transition sentences. Every single one. Most of my teachers were cool if I did everything else extremely well. And I, let's say I had, you know, six transition sentences, six transition sentences um, total, um, and then the intro and the conclusion as an example, right? Um, and if, you know, one or two weren't, you know, didn't, didn't say, you know, although this and while this, they didn't have the hook that connected to the earlier paragraph, I was still fine and I was still graded fine. But I think one or two of those teachers was a real stickler. So it just, it just depends. Most of the time, you want to, and, and in future videos, on future essays, I'm going to actually go a different, a little bit of a different route, because I'm, I'm now that I recall, um, there were times where I always had the transition sentences written before I even started the essay. Like every single transition sentence for every single body paragraph was written um, before I even started the essay. So, but for this one, I just go with the flow, um, but yeah, here, this is not um, as connective as far as like a hook. So we want to use it, and we want to make sure we're not using, like here we use not only but also, right? And then here we're using right from the poem's opening, um, which isn't really a transition sentence, but it kind of does because we're talking about, we mentioned the thesis in part one and two, and then boom, this is our... This is sort of our first paragraph. I don't think we're going to get punished in the first paragraph, especially if we're saying we're talking about chronology, um, which is a sort of a standard way to structure an opening of your argument. Saying, well, for, right from the poem's opening, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, and you usually don't want to use the word thesis. Like, you know, uh, our thesis is supported right from the poem's opening. Um you want to just show the evidence and prove your thesis with these arguments. Um, so I think that that, you know, is not, we're not going to get pu punished on that. It's when you get into the main body. So after that first paragraph, you want to generally have a hook. Um, m most of the time, if not every single time. So Pope not only uses a 10 to 1 ratio, which is what we just talked about, 10 to 1 ratio. Early in the poem, it shows greater disregard for unworthy critics than other poets. But later he also speaks of, Meeks speaks ill of most critics in general. So that hooks... From that previous uh, argument in the earlier paragraph with the argument that you're about to state here. Taking lines, and then boom, we're right into it. Mere action, and then we go over that. Okay, so here we do, although. Although Pope harshly censures below average literary critics in part one, he elects to spend some time in part two offering guidance, helping e each critic to become a perfect judge. Um, so what I want to do... You don't want to repeat phrases, right? So we could, we could, uh, you know, we could say, you know, a perfect judge will read each work of writ of wit. Now, generally, especially when you have these short lines, I like to, I don't always like to to put it in the body of the essay where it just flows, you know, like the same way we say here, most critics, or we say this whole thing here, right? However, I also don't like to only do this, right, where you offset. Um, I like to mix it up. Now, generally... As a main rule of thumb, if you've got, you know, four or more lines, you generally want to offset, right? 
but if you only have two and they're really short lines, then sometimes you want to put it just in the body, right? Like right here, the colon, and then we write it all out and we have a little forward slash to show the line break. And But at the same time, I don't only want to do that and I don't only want to do this. So I, I don't think it's a matter of rule. I just think it's a matter of style. You just kind of want to, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll make sure it's everything's correct and um, everything's lined up right. But right now, let's just do this lines blank and blank. So, um, and then just make sure the formatting is the same. Generally teachers, you know, unless you're talking about like works, a works cited page or bibliography or footnotes and notes, etc. You know, those should be based on a particular, you know, style, you know, MLA. I mean, well, um, but when it comes to in general stuff, that's more in the body, um, stuff that's more like this, I never in any of my classes got, you know, uh, sort of a style sheet where teachers would like mark you off. I think it's, you know, you sort of learn it along the way, um, from your, you know, middle school and definitely your high school teachers and cl your classes and your fellow classmates, but also, you know, so by the time, you know, yeah. So, um, but I also think that it's just a matter of just you doing the same thing every time. So if you have a good clean format that makes sense and it, it reads well, I think most teachers are not going to nitpick every little thing. If you're a really, you know, discriminating and thorough and proofreading writer, I think it'll come across and your teacher will cut you a little bit of slack when it comes to formatting. Um, now, again, that's just this stuff, right? But normally, you also want to take it from other papers you might have read, um, other papers the teacher might have gone over in class saying, hey, this is a good paper, this is a good argument, um, which they're more want to do in high school. I see that a lot more in high school. They usually don't do that in college. Um, but, um, you know, and, you know, just looking around, you know, looking at uh, other literary criticism as an example. Um, so, you know, but normally I offset these sometimes and then that'll be single spaced. Um, so yeah, so perfect judge, but we don't want it to like repeat that phrase. It's just, it's bad form guys. You want to be really creative and interesting. So let's, let's just rewrite that in our own words. So, um, you could say like an unerring, uh, I don't even want to say the word judge. You can say an unerring, um, critic, right? Um, to be a, or you could say, you could say either unerring or flawless. To become a flawless critic. Well, we just said critic, so let's just say become flawless. Offering guidance, helping each critic to become flawless. That's a lot. That's a lot. You can say offering guidance to help each critic become flawless. I like that. That flows a little bit better. And again, this all goes back to reading. You're like, well, how do you know? You know, well, it just it just sounds better. And again, I'm sure there are going to be some really wise, educated, um, either formally or informally or both uh, folks that are going to correct correct me, correct my mistakes, which that's that's fine. Um, but you know, hopefully, most of the stuff is pretty above board and and uh, on the right the right path. Um, Although Pope harshly censures below average literary critics in part, part one, he elects, he nevertheless, right? He nevertheless um, elects to spend some time in part two, right? Which shows the contrast. He nevertheless um, offering guidance to help, to help, right? Guidance to help each critic become flawless. Um or offering guidance in order to help. That's a lot of words. Offering guidance to um, offering guidance to help you. I think that's the minimum amount of words that makes sense that flows, and that's grammatically correct, I believe. Um, you could say offering guidance, helping, but you just said other ing words, other ing word, offering, helping. 
So I think a lot of times you have to say it out loud. But yeah, to go back to what I was saying is a lot of it is just your ear. Your ear is going to be so much more attuned if you read a lot when you're young. Um, I cannot stress this enough. And it sounds like I'm a fuddy-duddy, but it's just a fact. It's not necessarily an opinion. I think it's it's like a verifiable fact. Um, because it, it's just things are going to sound cleaner. You're going to be much more granular with regards to, you know, um, your word choices and your your ear. Your ear is just going to be so attuned. Um, it's just, it's, it's going to help. So, uh, you know, it's always a long route, guys. Life, you know, I know it's cool and hip to, to speed through stuff because we have so many tools that help us take shortcuts. But the long route is almost always the right route when it comes to getting really good at anything. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you don't mind, you know, um, doing okay in your classes, um, that's fine. I mean, you, you, you know, you don't, this stuff isn't as important in terms of like every little thing that I'm doing, not that big of a deal, right? But if you're reaching and you're trying to take more rigorous classes and you're trying to compete with the cream of the cream, and you're trying to perform well while you're competing with the cream of the cream in your community, um, you're going to have to, to uh, you know, really, really put in the work, put in the hours. And I think, you know, and it's, they call it leisure reading for a reason, because it's supposed to be leisurely. It's supposed to kind of be fun. You know, it's not supposed to be like a chore. Um, I think that's, you know, really helpful. Um you know, and that's that's why I think a lot of times this stuff will sound better. Um, it, you know, certain sentences sentences might sound better, and it's like, yeah, it just sounds better, and it'll just give you much much just more resources and tools um, when you're writing these essays, and just in life in general, right? Writing a business plan, writing writing emails, you know, writing a job application, a cover letter, writing a scholarship application. I mean, just a lot of a lot of um, you know, uh, there are a lot of places in life where it, it would behoove you to be able to communicate effectively. And the best way is, yes, to write a lot, but uh, I think re reading a lot um, is is a huge, huge plus um, in addition to, to writing a lot. So, um, and reading's fun. I mean, I, I know people that don't like writing. Even writers talk about, I don't like writing. I like having written, <laughs> you know, like professional writers. But I think a lot of people agree that, like, reading is kind of fun. You know, learning about all these stories. And, again, I definitely start I'm starting to sound like an old fuddy-duddy. But, yeah, uh, falling in love with reading is definitely helpful for doing the kind of work that we are doing um, here. So, yeah, I just think it sounds better. He nevertheless, although part partially centers below average loaded critics, part one, he nevertheless elects to spend some time in part two offering guidance to help each critic become flawless. A perfect judge will read each work of wit with the same spirit that its author writ. Okay, so now let's talk about um, here. Uh, here, Pope even connects. Uh, here, Pope makes a direct connection between right between his two among is more than two right so between and you want to do a perfect judge um meaning a perfect critic and then here i would use a hyphen here we use i just think it's easier to read especially if someone's reading it fast um and we haven't used that many hy hyphens in this essay so meaning a perfect critic. And it, it's a matter of style if you want to quote this. I generally will, don't like to quote my own words, um, especially if I'm sort of translating or explicating the poet's words because I want to leave that punctuation, that notation uh, reserved for the author's words in general, in general. Um, so, and I think the teacher could, uh, I don't know, 
let's say, I mean, maybe we can make it italics. I guess it might, might work using italics. And again, this is all very subjective. But I think the main thing is that you your style is the same. So if you go back and do proofreading, and you know that every time you have a quote, if you're literally translating or explicating the quote um, in different words, that exact line that you use italics every single time, then I think your teacher's going to be okay. You want them to be able to follow it. But if you keep changing it up, like you have italics in one way, and then the other time you do it, you have nothing. You, you don't change it at all. I mean, the, and then another time still, you have quotations. It's confusing. So you as the writer have to make sure that all of that stuff is is formatted correctly. It also shows there's like a subtle subtext that it shows the teacher that you're thorough and that you're committed to 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 performing um you know a good you know to to doing well in your role as the essay writer. You know, um and one of those things is to make sure that it's readable and legible and followable um if that's even a word. Uh so yeah, so like right here most critics Judgment in their mind. Yeah, so we're repeating those lines, and so we're quoting them. I think it fits that we decide not, not to use a quote. So we just have to make sure that all throughout the essay, if that ever happens, where we're changing the wording, um, you know, that we use the italics. Okay, so between a perfect judge, meaning a perfect critic, and between and um, the author, the author himself or herself. Here is where it fits using himself or herself because he doesn't talk about gender or um, if he does, um, I don't think he does, but if, if he does, we're not gonna talk about it where, you know, we've got a lot of, lot of lines. I don't remember him. Um, I mean, he says as men of breeding and all that stuff, but I don't think he makes, you know, but, but anyways, regardless, I think that this fits because this is a sort of, um, you know, this is uh, an intensive pronoun is what it's called, um, where it's even more intense. It, it, it basically intensive. I remember it by saying like it intensifies the clarity, right? It, it makes it makes it more clear. Like he decided to go to the store himself, right? What does that imply? Well, intensive pronouns, um, just as a little aside, they imply a previous dialogue. They imply a previous contrasting dialogue. So if you said he, you know, he decided to go to the store himself, period. What that implies is the dialogue was contrasting beforehand. So that, you know, um, maybe his girlfriend was going to like drive him to the store. Maybe his parents were going to drive him to the store. Maybe he was going to like, like, like drive, um, um, generally it's something, it's going to be contrasting, right? So if he says, so let me give you an example. So if you say he decided to walk to the store himself, that normally assumes that somebody was going to walk with him or he decided to drive to the store himself. That normally assumes there's a previous contrasting dialogue where someone else was going to drive him to the store. Um, but yeah, so and here we're saying here, Pope Mansur Gurdjieff kind of between becoming a perfect judge meaning becoming a perfect critic and the author himself by stating that so that's not not too uh, clear. Um, so we're clarifying, but if if we if that's not clear, we have to clarify. Maybe it's not a good place to put that. What we're trying to say is okay. So a perfect judge will read each work of wit, right? We'll read each each story with the same spirit that its author writ. So even even when it's saying this is how you become a perfect judge. Uh, maybe if I explain it out loud, it'll I'll be able to write it clearly. Um, but by it's saying that, you know even even if even when it says here's how to become a perfect judge, 
the first thing he's saying about that is he's comparing you to the writer. So he's he's literally, even when he gives you a compliment, even when he says, you know, here's how you become a perfect judge, he directly goes to compare you with the actual writer, which again supports our thesis because he's saying that um, he's now sharing specific guidelines for how one might become a great literary critic. But we're also, we have a sort of a two, two dimensional thesis here. One part of the, the thesis, which that definitely is, it's a guideline, right? But he's also maligning bad critics much more harshly. So he, we're still sort of showing that he defers to the writer. Um, he defers to the writer. He shows more deference to the writer than he does towards the critic in general. Um, and, and, um, in the same spirit. I don't know if I like this. All that explanation and I delete it, huh? Yeah. Excuse me on that. All right. Well, let's. Yeah. So we want to make it really, really clear. So um, that's going to be our second point because that's actually not exactly what our thesis is, right? Our second point is connects perfect judge to author. Right. Um, so even when to author spirit, so even when um, you know uh, giving guidance to critic about becoming perfect, which is our thesis, right? That's a piece of our thesis about becoming great, right? So we're not going to argue the world. We're just going to argue great because there might be other lines where he's not talking about perfection, just being great, being really good. Even giving writings to critic about becoming great, he says basically, like, follow the author. Follow the follow the, the great author, you know? Um, and then the point is that grants more uh, deference, right? More respect, more reverence to authors or content creators in general than um, and content critics. Yeah, I like that, content critics. Um, so these are just notes, um, and then we'll figure out if we're going to put, put that in or not. Okay, so let's go here. The same spirit that its author writ. So we want to make our first point. Our first point is here. Pope essentially. So you want to just directly just comment in your own words on what these two words mean. It's not like it's six lines and we're going to pick apart little phrases and stuff. It's two short lines. We want to just, you know, make a direct strong point. So here, Pope essentially is saying. That a um, a uh, an unerring critic or judge um, can become perfect by simply. Um, reading each uh, poem or story or book that an author writes. No, 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 no that an author writes. Because you're going to say, so each poem or story or book. So let's just do poem slash book. Simply reading each poem or book. 
So we'll, uh, I guess, add that bracket. Because the word is read that's in the quote, and then we're adding the ing. So by simply reading each poem or book, actually, we're calling them critic. A, a perfect critic can become perfect. No. So that a critic, simply reading each poem or book, Uh, in the in the same spirit that the author wrote the original poem or book in. I don't like dangling participles. I know I'm going to get crucified for it, but sometimes I think people are a little bit... Uh, they go, they're like, they go a little bit overboard on like, on like, this is kind of what Pope's talking about too, <laughs> is critics. But yeah, it's like, you know, you're, you're being so nitpicky, you know, like if you read a really good essay and like one or two sentences have dangling participles and it flows, but it still flows and, you know, you do everything else extremely well, then I think that's still an awesome essay, you know, um, you don't want to make a habit of it, but if once in a blue moon you have one, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I really don't. I think most teachers would agree as well. Um, it's really about the the overall, like the overall, like can can this writer create a cogent argument? Can every supporting, you know, quote and um, every supporting argument defend the thesis? Like if, if every argument defends the thesis, you know, you should get a decent grade. I mean, a lot of these other things that I'm talking about, you know, mixing the word choice up and the sentence, all that's helpful. But if you do all that, but you don't support your thesis with every single argument, then that's you're not going to get a very good grade, and rightfully so. You've got to support your thesis. That's so, that's like number one. I know I've said clarity is number one. But clarity and supporting your thesis <laughs> are number one. I think all this other stuff is like secondary and tertiary. Um still important but you know we've got to focus on the thesis so we'll, we'll that's why we keep going back up you know we keep going looking back up at the thesis specific guidelines maligning bad critics bad critics more harshly than bad authors well he's not talking about bad critics he's talking about how to become perfect so here we're talking about the first half of the thesis which is um uh which is uh giving them like guidance for becoming a good uh um, while Pope is clearly um, giving um, guidance here, is clearly giving guidance to critics. Let's you know, clearly giving guidance to critics for 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 how one might become a great literary critic. In order to help them but become become um, uh, better, well, Pope is clearly giving guidance to critics in general. Uh, I don't want to say in general and then in in and then in. While well, Pope is clearly giving guidance to critics in order to help them become better, um, he still is is um, placing them in the same, uh, he's basically placing them in the same category. He's, he's, he's basically saying to follow the, the, the great author. So let's, let's just cut this out, paste it here, cut this out. Okay, in the same, um, He's still placing them. Um, he's still referring to them. He is still. He's still referring to them. Um, merely in reference 
to the author. Um, and subtly grants the author. I'm going to just say subtly granting the author. Um, more deference in these lines as compared to the critic. So here, this supports our thesis. This supports the first half of our thesis. We're using the quote, and we're saying that, yes, he is giving guidance to critics in order to help them become better. Um, as compared to the critic. Um, therefore, I think we can make one more point to drive, one more clear point to drive that our point home. Therefore, um, certainly granting the author By doing so, and some sometimes your your sentences get too unwieldy, <laughs> um, so you just want to break them up, right? If you have so many commas, and you're like, all right, let me just break this up. By do, doing so, pup, pulp subtly grants the author grants authors more deference in these lines as compared to critics. Um, now this is the first this is the first time this is the beginning of the section when he's um, since this is the beginning and I think we're going to get some some kudos from the the teacher for identifying this. It's hard to read a poem. It's hard to pick apart a poem. Yeah, I think it's a lot harder to pick apart poems than it is to pick apart regular stories. Um, so I think we're going to get some credit for this. So we're going to say, look, since this is the beginning of the section, um, yeah, the stanza. This is there's just one stanza. Which makes it even easier for us to, to, to describe. Since this is the beginning, since these are the first two, two lines, let's just be very, very clear. The first two lines of the stanza where Pope is, uh, um, is assisting, is offering a recipe for the judge to become perfect. I don't want to use flawless here. I'm going to say let's just say improve Let's just say become better. Yeah, because the whole, even though we're introducing these first two lines, the next few paragraphs we're going to talk about this stanza. And the stanza, not every single stanza talks about the per being perfect. It's just talking about becoming better. So again, we're not arguing the world, right? So we want to sort of make sure we're, we're clear. And you guys might not think that like teachers can pay attention to this. These guys read essays all day long. You know, they, they're pretty, they're pretty good at it. Um, so, you know, you, and, and you don't know who you're, you know, I guess you don't know who you're dealing with. I don't know. I just, I'm not about the, the, the short shortcuts. I think that if you can always 
try to you know put your best foot forward i just think it's just it can only it can only you know it, it generally has uh better outcomes than than otherwise so here he nevertheless elects to spend some time in part two offering guidance to help each critic become better so yeah so here these first two lines he's talking about a perfect critic but we're introducing in part two we're gonna have more paragraphs so i think that that makes sense and also we don't want to keep talking about perfection 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 because um this is introducing you know these multiple quotes that we're going to talk about so um but here in this line we're talking about perfection so oh sorry all right so let's go here since these are the first two lines of the stanza, where Pope is offering a recipe for the church to become perfect, um, I'm going to leave it on a cliffhanger here. So I'm going to actually let's just finish this up. I want to get this. I want to get this paragraph done. I like this paragraph a lot. I think we spent a lot of time on it, but I think it's 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 in the right right. I think this can be our last sentence. So these are the first two lines of the stanza where Pope is offering a recipe for the judge to become per perfect. Um, it is perhaps. I propose that he again, uh, now we say deference, um, uh, conveys more respect for authors in general. Um, in relation so let's use a different uh phrasing so we say as compared to critics let's say in relation to critics in relates in general in relation to critics in general um Even though, even though these are the first two lines of the stanza, we'll focus on the recipe for the judges for it. or judge to become perfect. We used, uh, we haven't, we deleted it. I think we deleted it. But I don't know, I think the commas work, work well here. Because um, I don't think that's that amazing of a, of a point. Like, we know that it's a judge. Because um, we've used it here as well. Each critic. Eh, since we already used it there, actually. Let's just delete this. Each critic to become perfect, it is perhaps... I propose that, that Pope again... And again, we're not going to say the author. Face more because it's confusing, right? So that Pope again conveys more respect for authors in general, in relation to critics in general. Um, and then we go back to our thesis. We want to reaffirm our thesis. And here it is because he is again. This is kind of oh, I don't want to say setting the stage, but because he is. Um, reminding the reader of his um, of his uh, overall um, support really reference to the author and basically tells them to follow the author if you want to become great a great critic so here we just strip down the you know highfalutin language and we just nail it we just go directly at it it basically tells them to follow the author if you want to become a great critic but follow the author Because he is again is reminding the reader of his overall support 
of authors in relation um, over of authors. And then we can say, here we can say, therefore, now this is an, sort of an awkward argument because we're saying there isn't evidence in this line that supports our thesis, like that part of the thesis, but there is evidence in this line that suggests that we're going to see more support for our thesis in other lines. So it's, it's kind of a, um, you know, and I think this is rare. I don't think we should do this a lot, um, but I think that this is helpful. To, to mention this. I think it, 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 it's, it's a sh little bit of a stretch. It's a little bit of a risk, but I think it still makes sense. I think we can still make it make sense. Um, if it's overall support of authors, therefore, so we could say something like our argument, um, therefore, um, he again, again, instead of saying Subtly, you can say slyly, um, shows um, uh, maligns bad critics more harshly than 